picture this for a second, if you would. What if you could just slap more VRAM onto your GPU like Lego bricks? That'd be kind of fun. We're gonna dig into that dream, plus a 250 watt shunt modded RTX 5090 laptop that laughs at thermal limits. We've got Colorful's low latency DDR5 that makes RAM pretty dang stylish, plus Razer's wallet punching Pokemon gear. And Windows just debuted a little audio trick that nobody asked for, but everybody wants. And Zotac just leaked all over the place with an accidental RTX 5050 Ti leak. You know the drill, let's get into it. Just built a new PC like this guy? Well, now Windows 11 wants 200 bucks to activate it. Yeah, no thanks. Just head to CD Key Sales, hit the Windows 11 Pro page, use my code Zach at checkout. Look, I just used it. It dropped to 23 bucks. That just saved 30%. Here's the real price on screen, and yep, it's way cheaper than the official site. I typed in the key, I activated it in seconds, no issues. Windows 10 Pro, same thing. Just head to the Windows 10 page, code Zach knocks it to 18 bucks. Need Office 2019, you can grab that too. $53 with the code. It all works, I just paid and activated it live. CD Key Sales is doing a back to school sale right now. And all of the links are right here in the description. Don't miss it. And remember to use code Zach to save 30%. And now back to the news. Zotac just tripped over its own NDA and splashed RTX 5050 Ti across the internet. Now, budget gamers, start your hype engines. Maybe. Let's uh, dig into this a little bit. Now, I want you to raise your hand if you've ever leaked a product by accident and nuked your marketing plan because Zotac may have done just that. Let's check this out. NVIDIA's RTX 5050 Ti surfaces on Zotac's official website. New GPU model in the works? Well, maybe. Let's dig into it. The 5050 Ti might be the next budget-friendly GPU option by Team green, but there's a big old catch. The mid-tier GPU segment has definitely heated up since AMD released the RDNA 4 GPU models. NVIDIA competed with them in their 70 class and 60 class offerings, but Team Red, some great market adoption on the new RDNA 4 GPUs. Now, NVIDIA is looking to expand its GPU products, particularly the 50 class lineup that has only seen one skew for the past few years. And according to the Zotac Taiwan page, Team Green might be prepping for a 5050 Ti. Might be is the keyword here. This is the first time that we've seen a 5050 Ti mentioned there are some things on this that indicate that this may have just been an oopsie, but we'll determine if that's the case or not. So what is this? Is this a genuine Blackwell budget card or is this just an over-caffeinated intern that maybe typed a TI where it doesn't belong? Either way, Reddit, they're already uh, crafting a bunch of theories on power targets and memory configs and oh, we're having just so much fun with this one. Considering how poor of a reception eight gigabyte GPUs are seeing by the consumer market, they're not selling a whole ton of them, spoiler alert. It makes sense for NVIDIA to release a 5050 Ti 16-gig variant if they are eager to get market adoption, but that's yet to be seen for now. So while a lot of people are contemplating, you can see the leaked page here. Here's what actually happened. Let's just break it down for real. Someone, this is 100% a typo, in my opinion. This listing was spotted on July 19th on the Zotac warranty dropdown before it vanished. We have some screenshots before it went away. No specs listed, but historic 50 class cards land under the $300 range and they're targeting that 1080p at whatever FPS you can squeeze out of that. Now, the community split on this is just absolutely delicious. You have half of the people screaming that it's a typo and the other half are pre-ordering um, imaginary stock. Let me know where you sit on this one. Personally, I think it's just a typo. Sorry to break it to you. All right, now this is kind of cool. Colorful just dropped DDR5 sticks with cast latency 26 and anime sword aesthetics. Latency haters rejoice. Let's check this out. Now, Colorful has been making some pretty cool looking cards. In fact, I've had a few people in the comments on past videos mention, hey, I've got a colorful card. I love how this thing looks. We even talked about this colorful card that was seen at a recent expo that shows two SSDs mounted on top of the GPU and the design of the GPU itself. Actually very cool. I think this looks kind of sick. Colorful keeps kind of sneaking in is this like this B tier cousin that suddenly shows up with a Lamborghini. Some of the designs that they've come out with I think are actually really cool. So this is the new iGame Shadow 2 DDR5 memory and it's for Ryzen 9000 with cast latency down to 26. Now this is the brand new launch. This is the iGame Shadow DDR5 memory series designed specifically for the Ryzen 9000 series processors. These modules stand out for their high frequency DDR5 6400 speeds combined with ultra low CL28 latency and even CL26 making them one of the 
the fastest options for the AMD platform. These modules fully support AMD Expo profiles, so users can expect simple plug and play installation, which is really nice. Now, if you hate RGB, I hate to break it to you, but the light bar, it breathes seven colors like a sick rave dragon. So maybe not your thing. You can also just turn it off if you don't like it. But I think overall, the aesthetic of this, especially the white sticks of RAM, this is actually really cool and may make sense for a lot of builds. So if you're interested in this, pay attention. Now, while performance is the focus on these, Colorful has not ignored aesthetics. The Shadow 2 modules come with a unique ink wash inspired heatsink design and customizable RGB lighting available in, as you can see here, both black or white. Now we've got no pricing, release date confirmed on this yet, but we do know that uh, the first SKU that's gonna launch looks like a 48 gig kit. You can check that out. Looks like an awesome kit of RAM with insane cast latency, which is very, very cool. Might make sense for your next build. Check it out. Oh, Razer. Razer slapped Pikachu on everything and then they doubled the price. Almost. Got to tax them all. Let's check this out. Razer announces Pokemon Collection PC accessories. Razer and Nintendo revealed these Pokemon themed PC peripherals and the color selection and design. I'll leave it up to you. Let me know what you think about this in the comments down below. Also, while you're there, there's a nice subscribe button and a like button. You could hit those too. Just, just be for fun. The wait is finally over for fans who want their gaming setup to scream, I choose choose you and I choose Pokemon tax. Razer has expanded its officially licensed Pokemon collection to the US, Latin America, Europe, Australia, and New Zealand. The Razer Pokemon collection includes several of the PC gaming peripherals now redesigned with Pokemon themed visuals. So a lot of these products obviously already existed, just got the nice Pokemon skin on top of it, if that's kind of what you're looking for. Featured characters include Pikachu and the original Kanto starter trio. You got Bulbasaur, Charmander, and Squirtle. Lineup consists of Black Widow V4X mechanical keyboard, Kraken V4X headset, Cobra wired mouse, and the Gigantus V2 mouse pad. And each of them has their Pokemon elements here. You can see the mouse pad. Look at all of this beautiful footage. You've got the headset, the keyboard. Kind of interesting design though. Now I haven't bought a lot of Razer stuff probably in the past like 10 years. It's kind of what I started with on peripherals with keyboards like the Black Widow and things like that. But I haven't owned a lot of Razer products as of recently because there's been a lot of other great stuff in the market that I've really enjoyed. I'm daily driving a Gravistar keyboard right now, mostly because it looks like an alien gave birth to it. It's kind of fun. So what are people saying about this? Well, take a look for yourself. You know, fans love the mouse and the headset, but the keyboard is getting clowned on big time for just the repeating Pikachu heads. Like it looks like wallpaper from a daycare, quite honestly. Licensing fees, not cheap. So maybe put a little bit more effort into it, I would say. But listen, hey, collectors are going to buy it anyway. And FOMO Economics, they reign supreme, especially in this category. So let me know if you, uh, you're you a big Pokemon fan, if you're looking to pick this up or what you think about this design on these various peripherals. Check it out. Holy crap. Some Mad Lab bridged resistors on a 5090 laptop GPU. 20% more FPS and the warranty is sold separately. Let's check out what's happened to this laptop. NVIDIA GeForce RTX 5090 laptop GPU, 250 watt shunt mod unlocks 15 to 30% more gaming performance. GPU shunt modding, something that we recently discussed with the 5090 desktop card from Der Bauer, that Astral, and apparently this method, well, it's applied to laptops too. The reviewer explains that the shunt modding is not an easy modification for everyone. You gotta have some knowledge of electronics. You gotta do a little bit of soldering too, so it's not for the faint of heart. And just a quick recap, shunt modding, method of tricking the GPU into running at a higher TDP. By installing a new resistor or adding another one in parallel to existing voltage controlling resistor, the regulator can be fooled into thinking the GPU is consuming less power than it actually is. On the 5090 desktop card, this made it possible to increase TDP from 600 to 800 watts, but only as a demonstration of how it works. To recap, to boil it down, shunt modding is basically, uh, who needs a house fire when you've got benchmarks? That's shunt modding. So you can check out some of the benchmarks and average FPS here. Bumping the 5090 from 175 to 250 watts gives a clean 20% uplift. The laptop fans though, screaming like a jet on takeoff. So bring some earmuffs if you're planning on doing something like this. You can see the breakdown right here of all of the mod performance improvements, 3D Mark, Black Myth, Wukong, Cyberpunk. You can see all of these with the custom power curve enabled. Now it's worth mentioning that like, this is not something that you would necessarily wanna try on some of the big brand manufacturers. You have Electronics, Clevo, a lot of these different third party OEM designs, which make it somewhat easier to do. I think this was actually done on, I wanna say a Clevo laptop. Through a statement included in the video and through comments under it, you have two companies, you have XMG and Electronics expressing their interest in offering solutions for increased TGP in laptops. Both companies wanna expand the cooling capacity if needed, and they already offer liquid cooled solutions as well. So if uh, Der Bauer's 800 watt desktop mod was like a sledgehammer, this is a tactical nuke in a backpack. And Nvidia caps most 5090 laptops at 175 watts anyway, siding thermal headroom. So this is definitely something that's not for the faint of heart. It's going to go crazy in terms of thermals, but impressive nonetheless. I mean, look at some of these improvements. Let's dig into the comments, see what people are saying below. This one's actually very, very important. 
If anyone's thinking of overclocking a laptop, read the disclaimer and warning carefully. It's rare, unusual, risky, and not a viable long-term solution. Your laptop could melt. Desktops make for vastly superior gaming platforms because they aren't constrained by power and thermal limits like laptops are. I would be worried if your CPU and GPU combined exceeded 100 watts. And then you have some rebuttal to the wattage stuff here. I see you don't have a lot of experience with gaming laptop because upper mid-range and high-end laptops are designed to take 200 watts of CPU and GPU combined. Either way, I would be very cautious about voiding your warranty on a laptop, especially an expensive one like this, to do a little bit of shunt modding. But nonetheless, we'd love to see stuff like this because it's kind of cool to look at and see what the performance gains are. Let me know what you think about this in the comments down below. Imagine snapping extra VRAM like RAM sticks into your graphics card. That'd be kind of cool, right? Is it possible? Let's dig into it. What if GPUs had expandable memory? Revisiting the lost era of upgraded VRAM and why modern graphics cards abandon it. Now you'll remember we talked about colorful. They launched a GPU or are launching a GPU. It's kind of leaked at a recent trade show that shows two M.2 SSDs bringing extra slots on board. It's got a lot of people thinking, hey, like why can't we do that with VRAM on GPUs? Well, there is a lot that goes into that. We'll dig into it. But first, let's take a look at this story and see what the thoughts are on expandable VRAM on your GPU. GPUs back in the 90s did have an option to expand memory through a dedicated socket. With current GPUs from NVIDIA and AMD, there have always been issues with VRAM capacities. And this is a lot of this conversation is coming up because of those eight gigabyte cards and it not being enough VRAM. So a lot of people are saying, man, I sure wish that I could just add more VRAM onto my GPU. Wouldn't that be cool? While GPUs with eight gigabytes of VRAM were regarded as a reputable option a few years ago, in today's day and age, they aren't enough to run modern AAA titles. You ever wondered if your GPU could expand the VRAM on board? No gamer out there would ever run out of VRAM, right? And if they did, you could just slide in additional memory. This is kind of funny because I was looking at eBay and there's ATI Rage Pro. This is an AGP card from way back in the day that has memory expansion on it. So a lot of people are wondering, hey, if we could do it then, why can't we do it now? Or there's a whole lot that goes into that, right? Now, the reason for not having a socketed form is that modern day modules like the GDDR7 work on massive memory bandwidth and achieving such speeds requires creating a complex PCB design with the right memory controllers and power delivery. Having swappable VRAMs would disrupt the circuitry in modern times, and even if manufacturers manage to sort this issue out, modular memory slots generally require longer signal paths, additional connectors, which would compromise performance and won't give you optimal speeds. I'm gonna give you the real reason behind it, and this is boiled down, this is just my opinion. NVIDIA, AMD, love selling new GPUs, so I wouldn't bank on DIY upgrades anytime soon. So while everything I'm spitting at you is probably a, a cool history lesson that you probably already know, I think the bottom line is fix eight gigabyte base cards instead. That's maybe what the focus should be. And so you have a lot of people saying, well, if you can expand storage on a graphics card, like Colorful is done, and Asus even uh, had like a little demo with a 4060, 4060 Ti with expandable SSD slot on it. Those are totally different things, right? Colorful is just repurposing spare PCIe lanes. You know, mid-range Blackwell boards use eight times link, even though they sit in a 16 times slot. So the card splits the leftover lanes into two times four slots, essentially. The talk to M.2 drives just like any other NVMe device. But VRAM, that's an entirely different beast, right? Every trace has to be the same length and impedance, and even a tiny connector could wreck signal integrity. So there's a whole lot more that goes into, could we add extra VRAM onto today's GPUs? And then you add in the fact that the memory controller, the BIOS, and the power delivery are tuned for a fixed number of chips in fixed positions. While GPUs are advancing in their capabilities, less is being done to make these devices easier for the general consumer to access. This goes for a lot of things in tech. They don't want you tearing your stuff apart, upgrading it. They want you to throw it in the trash and buy a new one, which is an entirely different subject that we could get into. Most importantly, models aren't available at MSRP at all. So for the average gamer, getting GPUs is becoming more difficult with each passing day. Swappable VRAM looks out of the equation in modern times, but you never know. So the reason that a lot of these uh, companies are giving, or I guess the general uh, consensus why you wouldn't want to do this is socketing would add impotence, raise noise, wreck bandwidth, meaning that your upgrade might benchmark slower than stock, which is probably why no vendor is bothering with this. Now there's a flip side to this, and I'm gonna dig into this in the comments. I'm curious to see what you guys think too. This is a well thought out comment here. There's no technological barrier to add more RAM or VRAM to any GPU. When GPUs are tested, many special boards are used. Where I worked, they were shaped like MATX motherboards. Those boards have sockets and you just drop in the GPU chip itself and run tests. AMD and Nvidia just don't care for it. If they make already available sodium slot on the GPU for desktop RAM, AI could benefit a lot. And this is another thing. I'm just going to break away for a second. I think you're more likely to see this on enterprise cards than you would on consumer GPUs. Two, they can utilize a new standard slot or socket to add actual VRAM. This route has actually been done and is used when testing GPU 
compute chips. But the issue is, especially with Nvidia, they do not want to risk having to fight for allocation of VRAM with more players. It's a great point as well. A standard VRAM slot would mean non-GPU companies can make VRAM modules for consumers to buy, hogging up their allocations for integrating into GPUs and potentially causing delays. Let me know what you guys think about that down below. Another great comment, it's like RAM on a Mac. They're never gonna let you spend a hundred bucks on an upgrade when they can gouge an extra 500 for the next SKU. Great point. And you've seen this a lot. You see modular GPU ideas resurface on forums and Reddit every few years, and then they die under a cost analysis. But boy, wouldn't it be nice. Let me know what you guys think about this. Additional VRAM on GPUs. That would be kind of fun, but I don't think it's gonna happen anytime soon. Gotta sell all those new cards, right? We gotta get you to upgrade, I guess. All right, we're gonna wrap it up with this one. This is kind of cool. Windows might finally let you blast one song to two outputs. So janky voice meter setups beware. Check this out. This was discovered on the latest Windows build. Check this out. A Windows Insider user discovers an undocumented shared audio feature in the latest build. Quick setting allows you to play audio through multiple outputs. This is kind of cool. I feel like we've needed this for a while. Voice meter has helped with a lot of this. There's a lot of third-party plugins. Microsoft has reportedly added a new feature to the latest Windows Insider build that lets you play its output across multiple devices or speakers. Uh, this Twitter user shared screenshots that showed a new shared audio button in the quick settings panel. Beside the project button, that's already widely available on Windows 11 devices, when you click it, it reveals a selection of audio devices that are connected to your computer. You can then tick the check boxes on the devices that you want to listen to and click share to start outputting it across multiple speakers. Check it out. This is the tweet from this user, Phantom of Earth, who discovered this hidden in the latest dev and beta updates. At the moment, Windows doesn't support a native way of outputting audio to multiple devices. We all know this. There's a bunch of plugins that help with that. So you click it, tick a couple devices, and your laptop speakers and your Bluetooth earbuds jam together in unison. It's like AirPlay, but without the fruit logo tax. Now you had some people on Reddit actually go and test this and found out that it works well on wired outputs, but it chokes on dual Bluetooth for now. Um, obviously this is still an early release, so we'll see kind of what changes are made before this goes out to the general public. And let's also not forget that multi-output already exists on Apple and Android Android devices, so this is more or less Microsoft playing a little bit of catch up, but regardless, we'll take it. We'll see what happens if and when it graduates to a stable build. Now, if you wanna get hands-on experience with this, you've gotta be a Windows Insider. You need to sign up and join the Canary channel. How often, I mean, these are the unstable builds that you'll be getting on this too, so, you know, user beware on this stuff. Guys, that's gonna do it for today. Make sure that you hit like and subscribe down below. It helps the channel to grow. Maybe leave me a comment as well. Let me know where you're checking in from. And as always, we will see you next time.